Pope Francis talking about the abuse in the church. He made his first Vatican appearance since a bombshell report accusing him of covering up accusations of sexual misconduct against an ex-cardinal. The Pope mentioned church officials' lack of response to abuse in Ireland, but he did not mention the abuse accusations in the United States at all. Our chief religion correspondent, Lauren Green, has the news now. Lauren. Hey, Shep. Well, as you know, the uh, Wednesday general audiences are supposed to be a spiritual event where pilgrims from all over the world can see the Pope in person, sometimes for the first and only times in their lives. Well, today's audience had a dark cloud over it. As you mentioned, it was the Pope's first public appearance since a controversial letter was released by a former Vatican official. The church has been embroiled in a sexual abuse controversy and calls for the Pope himself to resign. The letter alleges he knew the depth and scope of the abuse long before it became public in Pennsylvania's grand jury investigation. The Pope did not address the letter or the investigation, but expressed remorse for sex abuse victims in Ireland, whom he met with during his recent trip to the country. Church authorities in the past weren't always capable at adequately handling these crimes. The meeting with some survivors, eight exactly, left a deep mark on me, and in many occasions I asked the Lord for forgiveness for the scandal and the sense of betrayal that was caused. Now, since the letters released, the American Bishops National Review Board calling for an investigation led by non-clergy members into the misconduct into the church. Chef. And we're hearing from the Archbishop who wrote that letter. Right, it's uh, Viga, Vigano. He broke his silence today in an Italian blog saying what he did was out of love for the church. Vigano said he was, quote, serene and at peace, but saddened by attempts to undermine his credibility. He also said, quote, I spoke out because by now the corruption has arrived at the top of the church hierarchy. Vigano's claims have thrown the papacy into turmoil because Francis has always expressed a zero tolerance for priest sexual abuse of minors, and now there are calls by bishops to investigate the accusations in the letter. Shep. Lauren Green, live in New York. We're following the latest developments on Pope Francis as the global sex abuse crisis plagues the, the Catholic Church. There are growing questions over what Francis knew concerning abuse allegations. Former Vatican official Archbishop Vigano has demanded the Pope resign. He published a letter accusing Francis of covering up sexual abuse claims. And now a group of Catholic women are writing to the Pope to demand answers. And one of those women is Catherine Jean Lopez. She's a senior fellow at the National Review Institute, and she's also the editor at large of National Review Magazine and joins me here. Thank you so much for joining me. So let me get your take on this letter from um, uh, Vigano or Vigano, I can't remember. Vigano. Vigano, right. What you what you make of that letter? Well, it's shocking when, when you read the letter. And um, but, but the takeaway is, is this true or not? Right. Because this is one man's, quote, testimony. Um, and I, I don't put it in quotes because because it's a question. It was mm -hmm. essentially a memo of his his testament to, to what um, his version of the story. Right. And um, on his uh, way back from Ireland this weekend, reporters asked him. He famously does these these uh, press conferences on planes. Yes. And he said he was wouldn't say a word. Right. And that left, frankly, a lot of Catholics heartbroken. <laughs> you know, were mad and upset and humiliated and and. Um, and so a group of, of Catholic women, there are about 60 signatures at the moment, it'll be released uh, a little later. Some of them seminary professors, um, a lot of them mothers and, and, and daughters of the church are simply asking, is what the archbishop said true or not? Right. Um, as we try to get to the bottom of what's been going on, what is at the root of the mismanagement and the corruption and, and the evil that we've been seeing in the Catholic Church, it's truly anyone who read any of the headlines or any of the P Pennsylvania grand jury mm -hmm. report, it's just de demonic. Yeah. We believe in evil and this is evil, you know? Um, and so it has to be rooted out and we have to get to the bottom of this. So, so. The big question right now is, what did Pope, Pope Francis know? What did Pope Benedict know? And and um, who needs to resign? Right. There are all these questions, um, but but we're on a long fact-finding um, mission right I, now. I think you know his reaction on the plane stood out because so often he's very open right. in those question and answers, and I, I think this is probably the first time that he his response was essentially, "Well, you read it and tell me what you think," which I thought was odd. It it was it was bewildering to yeah. a lot of people, frankly. The one thing
thing that is consistent, actually, w with Pope Francis in that is that he, there, there, there's a divide in the church that didn't start yesterday, you know, mm -hmm. or this weekend with the, the, with the release of the Vigano letter. Um, he, Pope Francis likes to have that out in the open. And so you really do see sort of a civil war going on. Right. Um, you know, it's one of so the- So let's talk a little bit about that because it has been on those plain interviews where the president, where, sorry, the Pope has said things about, uh, uh, gay people has said things about abortions that certainly, um, uh, display a more compassionate mm -hmm. point of view than we've seen from the church before. Many have seen him as a more progressive, mm -hmm. a refreshing sort of pope. Some people find that very uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. And there has been a suggestion that perhaps Vigano's motives are not completely sincere. Right. He's, um, he leans more conservative and maybe there's politics at play right. here. Now, and that's the church at, at its worst, frankly, right. when politics gets involved. Yeah. And, um, and all of what you just said is, is entirely true. Um, Pope Francis likes to make people uncomfortable. Yeah. And he also, I think, knows that he has a gift for people to take a second look at the church um, and see it as more compassionate and see it as more, more than just nose to things, right? Prohibitions and things. Um, but he also knows that there is this divide about questions of celibacy and the priesthood and the male priesthood, all these things, and he wants to have those out in the open. So people going after one another is actually consistent with Pope Francis. Right. The Turkish lira is in the tank, the Argentine peso crashed to record lows, and the new Boliviar has left millions of Venezuelans with worthless paper in their pockets. There's a global currency crisis brewing, and Manila Chan is following the story, and she joins us now with more. Hi, Manila. Hi, Natasha. So we've been hearing for weeks now how the Turkish lira has taken a, a dive since the latest spat with President Trump, but now uh, other nations with not so great relations with the U.S. are also seeing their currencies take a hit as well. This week, the U.S. dollar was up another 4% over the Turkish lira, which overall has seen approximately a 40% depreciation since the start of 2018. And folks in Turkey and investors alike unloading their lira on news from Reuters, citing unnamed sources close to the matter, saying Turkey Central Bank Deputy Governor Erkan Kil Kilmici was getting ready to resign. Now, Turkish President Recep Erdogan has been not notorious for pressuring the central bank against tightening monetary guidelines, so much so that he dubbed himself the enemy of interest rates. But as the majority of economists would tell you, keeping rates artificially low will ultimately hurt your economy, which is what we're seeing today in Turkey. So Erdogan spat with Trump right now, not making things better because Trump's influence is weakening emerging markets across the globe. Take, for example, Argentina. They are Latin America's third largest economy. They are teetering on the edge of default as they struggle to repay debts from heavy government borrowing. The Argentine government has reportedly asked the IMF to release a $50 billion loan to the government early, ahead of schedule, so they can avo avoid default. Now Russia is inflaming tensions with NATO as it plans to hold large military exercises in the Mediterranean Saturday. NATO's chief spokeswoman urged restraint on the part of the Russians and all actors in the region, saying they could worsen the war in Syria. At least eight ships have joined Russia's fleet in the last three weeks. And Russia's Ministry of Defense says the war games will involve 25 naval vessels and 30 warplanes. Russia has provided crucial military support to Syria's government forces. 
Despite that, NATO said it would not speculate on Russia's intentions. A Russian newspaper said the country's naval buildup is in response to the actions of the U.S. and its allies in the region. A State Department spokeswoman called that allegation, quote, false flag reporting. The president was willing to suspend those uh, joint military drills that the U.S. does with South Korea as right. a uh, as a gesture of good faith, if you will. Uh, Secretary uh, Mattis addressed those drills on the Korean Peninsula. I want to play a little bit of what he said. We'll talk afterwards. As you know, we took the step to suspend several of the largest exercises as a good faith measure uh, coming out of the Singapore summit. Uh, we have no plans at this time to suspend any more exercises. Uh, we will work very closely, as I said, uh, with the Secretary of State and what he needs done, we will certainly do to reinforce his effort. But at this time, there is no discussion about further suspensions. Uh, you remember during that summit, the president called them war games. A lot of people were upset about that using the, the phrasing that North Korea would have used. Is there a risk if they determine that it's OK to restart these joint drills? Well, these joint drills have been going on for decades, and they're legal, and they're just part of, you know, making sure in different scenarios that uh, these two uh, teams would be prepared to work together. And so they're not new, but they have been uh, annoying to North Korea for all those decades because, you know, the North obviously does not want uh, other uh, potential adversaries to be engaging in that sort of practice. So the risk really is just sending a strong message to Kim Jong-un that, look, we said we would suspend them if things were going well, if talks continued. But obviously now that they are resuming, it signals that, you know, those talks are starting to fall apart. So it's just another pressure point, as it seems this administration is returning to their original campaign of maximum pressure to try to get North Korea to bow and to take some real significant actions toward getting rid of their weapons. But as you mentioned, Emory, even though they, you know, uh, frequently talked about the fact that Pyongyang hadn't been testing missiles and they were going to dismantle a testing site, there was always the question of what about the existing weapons? And we've so far seen no evidence of how the North plans to gather those and get rid of those for good. And that's always been, you know, really one of the core issues that it was never resolved during that summit. Indeed. Weijia Jiang, thank you. Thank you. Uh, the president uh, has canceled Secretary of State Mike Pompeo's trip to Pyongyang, citing a lack of progress with the denuclearization process. What are the new hurdles? What's going on here? So for the first time, President Trump acknowledged that there was not enough progress being made between the two sides. And that's why, you know, he canceled this trip after on Friday, the national uh, security team reviewed a letter from North Korea. And even though we don't know the specifics of that letter, we know that it led to President Trump tweeting that he has asked Secretary Pompeo to cancel what would have been his fourth trip uh, to talk with North Korea on these negotiations. So um, to answer your question about what went wrong. The thing is, even though this is the first time the president is acknowledging there has not been progress, we've been watching this lack of progress since he met with Kim Jong-un back in June. Uh, when he returned from that trip, he made the very bold declaration that there is no more nuclear threat from North Korea. And the only evidence of that was this joint statement that the two signed that both sides were committing to work toward that goal. But Anne-Marie, from the very beginning, the problem is, even though they had bullet points in this statement, there were no details about how the North was going to do this, what immediate steps they were going to take, and what they had agreed upon uh, would happen after each of those steps. Last week, residents here went on the rampage on Wednesday, accusing foreign shop owners of selling expired food. Ironically, some looted the expired food itself. The unrest left four people dead and 27 arrested so far. This Bangladesh national is among the few brave enough to keep their shops open. He has been running his business here for nine years and has been attacked four times. At the moment, we also are scared to do the right business, nicely business. You see, those people like how it is. When you see them, then you can see the, how they like an animal, the attacking. It's like that. 
they attack us. This was a scene in Soweto earlier this week. This landlord watched helplessly as his tenant's shop was looted. They took up their everything, you know. So in order to stay on a safer side, I had to open up my gate so then I can allow uh, people to enter my yard because of I was afraid that they'll demolish the whole structure. He says he now fears renting out his shop. But I'm really afraid because of my safety. I'm a parent, I've got two kids, I've got a wife, so I don't know, you know, what is going to happen in future. With the shops closed, residents are also feeling the pinch. Sibusi Sozwane has walked three kilometers to buy food. It's an inconvenience because we now have to walk long distances. I have walked all this way just to buy these three items. Shops remain closed and foreign nationals have fled the areas where violence fled up. Community members are divided about the events that played out this week and whether foreign shop owners should return. They must go back to their homes because they are harming our children by selling expired food. What they did is wrong because even now we don't have anywhere to buy food. But for some local businesses, the closure means a spin-off in profits. I am happy all my customers are back. After being called out for citing anonymous sources who claim they were misquoted, CNN is now in the spotlight for its low ratings. RT's Rachel Blevins has the story. The latest cable ratings are here, and despite proudly broadcasting the slogan of the most trusted name in news, CNN is still behind a number of networks, including HGTV and the History Channel. In fact, CNN did not even make the top five, and it instead came in seventh in primetime ratings behind both Fox News and MSNBC. CNN has made a name for itself with hosts such as Anderson Cooper and Chris Cuomo, who are paid multi-million dollar salaries. But when it comes to ratings, the public would rather watch shows that teach them tips and tricks to improve their home on HGTV, or they would rather be entertained by shows about alien and conspiracy theories on the History Channel. Yet even though CNN's ratings appear low in comparison with other cable networks, Forbes noted that Nielsen's stats show CNN's ratings were actually the second highest they have been in the network's overall history. But that is still not enough. CNN is still lagging significantly behind Fox News, which is holding strong at number one for the 200th month in a row. When compared, Fox News has more than 1 million primetime viewers more than CNN, and this could be attributed to the fact that CNN has been accused of deceiving the public by staging fake protests and falsifying reports by misusing anonymous sources. While the latest ratings may not indicate that the public has had enough of the mainstream media right now, they do show that the majority of Americans would rather watch ancient aliens than CNN. In Washington, Rachel Blevins, RT. And for more, we're joined by Georgia State Representative Erica Thomas and Carrie Sheffield, National Editor of Accuracy in Media. Thanks so much for joining us tonight, ladies. Thank you. So, Erica, what do you attribute CNN's drop in ratings to? Content, or do you think their base is more than happy with what they're running? Well, you know, I would say that with them saying that this is one of their, their top ratings in years for them, that their base is probably happy with what they're saying. But, you know, when you have so much dilute from so many people saying the media is our enemy and our president even saying the media is the enemy of America, you know, a lot of people are feeding into that. And I think that that attributes to a lot of it when they're downgraded every single day and pounced on every single day by a lot of politicians that people are listening to it really puts them on the downside and I hate that and now to be fair CNN isn't the only news organization seeing a drop in viewership by the larger picture and according to Pew Research cable news network news and even local news are seeing a drop in ratings so Carrie do you think this is a result of people getting their information from social media and even late-night comedy shows 
Uh, sure, I do think that part of that is driven by alternative sources like late night news. I also think that the untold story here is about digital. A lot of people are turning to social media, they're turning to the internet, they're turning to Snapchat. So part of that for CNN is just the overall decline in cable news period across the board. So that's part of it. I do think though the brand of CNN has problems. And look, I write columns for CNN, uh, I, I go on their shows, uh, so I respect bipartisan dialogue, but I think part of why, as the reporter mentioned, Fox does so much better is because there's this enormous void in the mainstream media. We see, as the president cited, I went to the Harvard Kennedy School and the president cited this report from the Harvard Kennedy School showing 91% in that neighborhood of mainstream media stories about this White House were negative. And so people are upset because they see this is an unprecedented level of negativity toward any White House. And so when you have the press playing the role of advocate instead of a neutral reporter, then people want to turn to get the other side, and that's why they go to Fox. Giants are obviously politically biased against conservatives. No one really disputes that. But Exhibit A is special hostility to people with pro-life views. They're hated above all. Lila Rose would know. She's founder and president of Live Action. That's a pro-life group. And she joins us tonight. Lila Rose, thank you for coming on. Tell us your experience with social media. Sure. So Live Action is the lar has the largest following online for the pro-life movement. Over 3 million people. Our videos have hundreds of millions of views online. And for the last three years, we have been totally banned from doing any advertising on Twitter. Meanwhile, Planned Parenthood and other pro-abortion groups are advertising, and they're even advertising petitions to further suppress and censor live action and other pro-life groups. So this is what we've been facing now for three years. Look, can I stand three steps back and make an obvious point? If the advocates for abortion really believed it was such a good thing, they wouldn't be so hysterically intent on shutting you down or letting another voice in. They, they know they're wrong, and that's why they suppress speech. But let me just ask the sort of practical question, how can that be? Do you have any recourse? I mean, these are, in effect, public utilities. Is there anything you can do about it? Well, we've, we've looked at it. I mean, we're, we're ultimately going on other platforms and making sure that we can reach people directly through our own website and finding other ways to reach people because ultimately Twitter has sided with the abortion industry. I mean, that's what's clear. Despite their claims, despite Jack Dorsey, their CEO, going on the news in the last several weeks and saying, look, we do not discriminate based on viewpoint. That's what we do not do at Twitter. He's flat out lying. He's lying to people. And we are, as you say, Exhibit A. Look, the other part of this, like you just said, Tucker, is the fact that when people learn the truth, especially about this human rights issue of abortion, when they learn about what abortion is, what it does to, a, to the child in the womb, we have an abortion procedure series of videos that have been viewed over 100 million times. We survey people and they change their minds on abortion. People are having aha moments saying, wait a minute, this is, this is violence against a child. This is harmful to women. We don't want this anymore. That's what Twitter, I believe, is afraid of, because they know that when the truth gets out there about the humanity of the child in the womb, about what abortion is, the abortionists lose every time. Right. And that's why Twitter is so interested in defending abortion interests, because that's their ideology, despite the lies of their own CEO about them not having a viewpoint. Yeah, the last thing they want is a conversation about it. They want to squelch anything they don't agree with. Lyra exactly. Rose, thank you. Good to see you. Thanks, Tucker. Air pollution is causing a huge reduction in intelligence. That's according to a new report in the journal Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. It says the damage from polluted air is like reducing your level of education by one year. And the effects are even more pronounced for those over the age of 64. Add this to an earlier report which says 95% of the world's population breathes unsafe air and the results are alarming. For more, we turn to legal and media analyst Lionel. Thanks for joining us today, sir. Thank you. So if this study is true regarding air pollution causing a reduction of one's intelligence, why are homes and apartment buildings being built closer and closer to freeways? <laughs> Nothing like a great question. You know, here in New York, uh, it's very, very common to see more and more people wearing masks, you know, like uh, surgical masks. And some people would say, you know, um, isn't that a bit much? I mean, what is this, a fad? In fact, believe it or not, in many jurisdictions, it's against the law to wear a mask. Read the particular article that we're speaking of. 
It is the most shocking and terrifying thing, and I don't know. And you know, every time I watch this great program, whether it's glyphosate, we're going to talk about 5G. Now we're talking about this. Here's a couple of critical things. Number one, Natasha, this is not climate change. You know, a lot of people turn off. They go, oh, no, not the climate change again. No, 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 no. This is air pollution. Good old-fashioned, plain old air pollution. Not climate change, not anthropogenic theories. No, 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 no. Not Michael Moore and Al Gore. This is air pollution, dirt, grime, filth, and what you between mold and everything internally. The results are oxidative stress. What is that? Free radicals. What if we take free radical, anti-free radical vitamins and the like? Neurodegeneration, neuroinflammation. Then the, the article and the study points out that it can affect older people, 62, 64, 65. Why is that important? Well, they're older, but some of the most important decisions in their life for long-term care, financial uh, considerations, it's critical for them to have a clear mind. Children also. Then they throw in, I mean, this, this, this article has no end. Then they talk about mental health. And we don't know, does this exacerbate a problem? Does this uh, cause a problem? And Natasha, the, the, this, is, this is, again, not a, an alarm. This is not, as they used to say, you know, tree hugging, some wacky environmentalist. This is real. This is critical. And this is happening now. Yeah, I mean, that leads me to my next question, a point you brought up. It's interesting because, I mean, the study does shed light on air pollution causing 7 million premature deaths. On top of that, harming people's mental abilities. So, I mean, we have a huge issue of mental illness in this country, as you know. And so instead of prescribing pills, maybe we can do something about the air we breathe. And also, it's, it's right. And, and sometimes my, my concern is, Natasha, not, not, not to, to, or, or to address the malaise that people have. You know, people are habituated. When you turn on, especially, I hate to say it, any good news program, you're going to be bombarded with, we haven't even got to the 5G stuff yet. Don't even bring that up yet. But people are saying, oh, no. Or they'll say, look, this is just something that comes with living in an urban environment. This is, the, this is progress. What are you going to do? The statistics, 95% of the planet, 95% is, is affected by toxic air pollution that affects children and also Think of where we, we are being bathed in. Think of this mess. Wi-Fi, 5G, forget our food, glyphosate, and now this. And yet somehow we're not, you know, the mortality rates are, are, are decreasing. Uh, people are living longer. It's amazing. And that's a lot of reasons, frankly, to be most frightened. Indeed. And, and clearly the carbon taxes aren't working either. We need to find a, a better solution. Thank you so much, Lionel of Lionel Media. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. And there is a new top car in the luxury auto world, and no expense has been spared. RT's Trinity Chavez has that story. Luxury cars are getting even more luxurious. French manufacturer Bugatti, who made this $2 million Veyron and the $3 million Chiron, just rolled out its latest supercar, and it's double the price. Named after two-time Targa Floria winner Albert Devo, the supercar is a limited edition on sale for a whopping $5.8 million. That's almost double the price of the maker's current model, the Chiron. Bugatti stands for innovation, and I think that uh, for us it's uh, important to always lead not only the super sport car manufacturers, but the automotive world, and this is something which we are very proud of. The Bugatti Diva was shown off for the very first time at the Quail Motorsports Gallery in California. The makers say the luxurious supercar has the same 1,500 horsepower as the Chiron, but is much lighter and has better handling.